philosophical contemplation, which remains trapped in conceptual language, and the experience of natural beauty and that of art beauty, which remain hermetic if they are not interpreted through philosophy and conceptual language. So you see there's always the same problematic circle. If Adorno's writings still have a persuasiveness, it lies in the radicalism in which they strive for the understanding of the concrete detail, experience, perception, notion, and their attempt to cast off the debris and waste of everyday affirmative babble and unreflected double talk. In Minima Moralia, Adorno writes that the truth of psychoanalysis is found in its exaggerations, and that accounts for him just as well. There's a famous and often quoted line from his philosophy saying that there is no true life possible in a false world. After the passionate reception of critical theory from the end of the 60s until the mid 80s, one seemed to be through with this sentence, but it is still true. The critical concept of cultural industry and the universality of blindness through the ideology of consumerism may even be more relevant today because the rise and domination of global capitalism has rendered even more power and meaning to the entertainment industry because nothing else seems to be left after the loss of any utopian horizon, at least for the time being. Any more relaxed, happy, affirmative, so to say, cool theory of a mild, progressive cultural subversion appears weak and conformist in the face of global political and economical power structures and their effect upon the daily life in our societies. The primacy of the object in Adorno's thinking, the materialistic, organic, somatic, corporeal aspect of it, on one hand, is related to the meaning of natural beauty in his aesthetic theory, where the experience of natural beauty is held in the highest esteem. And it's a lot of this nature around here that he's thinking of. There is no understanding of art beauty in Adorno without understanding of natural beauty, which again is only possible through the reflection of how much any direct, naive experience of nature is blocked and ideological, how mediated and historical any kind of experience of natural beauty will be. And now there is a longer quotation from aesthetic the theory, but since it's such a difficult stuff, it may be just be okay to just hear a few lines. Just how bound up natural beauty is with art beauty is confirmed by the experience of the former. For it, nature is exclusively appearance, never the stuff of labor and of the reproduction of life, let alone the substratum of science. Like the experience of art, the aesthetic experience of nature is that of images. Nature as appearing beauty is not perceived as an object of action, the slowing off of the aims of self-preservation, which is emphatic in art, is carried out to the same degree in aesthetic experience of nature. To this extent, the difference between the two forms of beauty is hardly evident. Mediation is no less to be inferred from the relation of art to nature than from the inverse relation. Art is not nature, a belief that idealism hoped to inculcate, but art does want to keep nature's promise. It is capable of this only by breaking that promise, by taking it back into itself. This much is true in Hegel's theorem that art is inspired by negativity, specifically by the deficiency of natural beauty, in the sense that so long as nature is defined only through its antithesis to society, it is not yet what it appears to be. What nature strives for in vain 
artworks fulfill, they open their eyes. Once it no longer serves as an object of action, appearing nature itself imparts expression, whether that of melancholy, peace, or something else. Art stands in for nature through its abolition in effigy. All naturalistic art is only deceptively close to nature because, analogous to industry, it relegates nature to raw material. That was the quote. From the other perspective, the art experience being compared to the experience of nature, here are a few lines from the chapter on enigmaticalness in aesthetic theory, which also gives us a secret self-portrait of the author. He alone would understand music who hears it with all the alienness of the unmusical and with all of Siegfried's familiarity with the language of birds. Now that is not Roy's Siegfried, that is the Nibelungen's and Wagner's Siegfried. <laughs> what Adorno refers to is not the elitist, privileged access of someone who knows a secret code, but on the contrary, someone who is kept in touch with primary experience and perception, the impressions and passions of childhood, which are also perceptions and notions of both individual and collective archaic stages. There's a constant dialectics of the archaic and the contemporary of the mythic stage and modernity in Adorno's works, the utopia of sexual bliss and of the arcanum of metaphysics are closely linked to the sphere of the archaic, the body, the animal. There's a passage in aesthetic theory about this. Again, a quote. In its clownishness, art consolingly recollects prehistory in the primordial world of animals. The collusion of children with clowns is a collusion with art, which adults drive out of them, just as they drive out their collusion with animals. Human beings have not succeeded in so thoroughly repressing their likeness to animals that they are unable in an instant to recapture it and be flooded with joy. The language of little children and animals seems to be the same. But again, listening to a bird song, to a bird song, which would be an essential experience of natural beauty, is at the same time deeply ambiguous, which tells something about the necessity of art beauty as a corrective measure for the deficiency of natural beauty in Adorno's philosophy and for the need for mediation, respectively the rejection of immediacy. There's another quote now. The anamnesis of freedom and natural beauty deceives because it seeks freedom in the, old, in the old unfreedom. Natural beauty is myth transposed into the imagination and thus perhaps requited. The song of birds is found beautiful, beautiful by everyone. No feeling person in whom something of the European tradition survives fails to be moved by the sound of a robin after a rain shower. Yet something frightening lurks in the song of birds precisely because it is not a song, but obeys the spell in which it is enmeshed. The bird cannot choose to sing or not to sing. The fright appears as well in the threat of migratory flocks, which bespeak ancient divinations, forever presaging ill fortune. With regard to its content, the ambiguity of natural beauty has its origin in mythical ambiguity. This is why genius, once it has become aware of itself, is no longer satisfied with natural beauty. As its prose character intensifies, art extricates itself completely from myth and thus from the spell of nature which nevertheless continues in the subjective domination of nature. 